Hello and welcome to the Unbundled Attorney Mastermind Podcast. My name is Dave Ahrens and I'm the founder and CEO of Unbundled Attorney. In this podcast, we interview our Unbundled Attorneys, as well as the leading experts in the industry to identify the best practices for converting leads into paying clients and how to ethically and profitably deliver unbundled legal services and other affordable options in your practice. To learn more about how exclusive unbundled leads can help you grow your practice, visit our website at unbundledattorney.com. All right, welcome everyone to the Unbundled Attorney Mastermind Podcast. This is also going to be a video podcast, so if you'd like to watch the video, you can join our come on the YouTube channel by searching for Unbundled Attorney on YouTube, uh, or the link to the YouTube channel and this episode will be in the podcast notes uh, at unbundledattorney.com forward slash podcast. Uh, just look for this episode with my man here, Charles Lee, who is uh, one of our Unbundled Attorneys in Los Angeles, practicing in immigration law. And we're really excited to have him join us today because it's been uh, quite a good you know, last few months working together so far. There's obviously a lot of things going on in the immigration world, a lot of changes. And so looking forward to just chatting with you about what you've seen in the industry and, and how you've also been finding uh, ways to serve so many of these clients we've been sending you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. For the opportunity. Great, man. So what, what might be helpful is just to give a bit of background on how you got your start in the practice of law. Um, why for you, you've uh, focused in on uh, immigration. Okay. Um... Out of law school, I had a job as a clerk at an immigration firm under um, an immigration and nationality law specialist. So in California, you take the bar exam, and you can take another exam specializing in certain fields, for example, and immigration is one of them. And I was lucky in that I worked under um, a really good attorney and you know, I got some immigration experience there that helped build my resume to land a job serving unions. Mm. And um, they had a prepaid legal plan where I had the opportunity to do some immigration, some family law, some bankruptcy, a little bit of multiple areas of law. Uh -huh. And what helps in that is it helps you decide, I don't like this one, I don't like that one. And consistently with immigration law, the, the joy and the um, feeling of fulfillment that you receive when you help someone get a you know a green card or citizenship it's 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 a lot more rewarding at least for myself than it is for cases where i say you know congratulations your divorce is finalized or, <laughs> i mean although sometimes that's great but other times there's a congratulations you're now bankrupt yeah. <laughs> so those those versus the congratulations you're a green card holder or a citizen welcome to the united yeah, states right like, yeah. those much better feeling at the end of the day um so that helped me focus on immigration um after leaving that firm where i served the union i worked under a couple more immigration specialists here in los angeles and learned more of the intricate parts of the law more of the intricate parts of the practice mm -hmm. and you know it it's a sense of purpose my parents came here as immigrants i was privileged to be born here um, but having seen my parents live the immigrant life leaves a, a little something more on my heart um, and i've always wanted to be a good attorney and at first i thought that meant you know making tons of money mm -hmm. but when my father told me to be a good attorney the first time, what he meant was be a good person that is also an attorney. Yeah. And when I help the immigrant community, um, I feel like a good person, I guess. So that is my reason for choosing immigration law. And I've made it my purpose and my higher purpose to help as many people as I can. Hmm. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Thank and, you. And I definitely get that. Um, that sense of purpose that you bring to it. I mean, just in the times we, the time that we've spent <laughs> together and working with Graham as well, and cool. certainly with the way you've been working with the clients we send you, it's uh, it's very apparent. Okay. So I acknowledge that. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about on any of the previous podcasts is is the legal plan that you actually worked as a legal plan provider. Oh. A lot of attorneys aren't uh, aren't aware of how that works. Oh. Could you share just a little bit about? how you used to work as a legal access plan provider, what some of the benefits you would provide. Sure. Um, 
Sure. So, I mean, as anybody knows, there aren't many unions anymore in mm -hmm. our country, unfortunately. Um, but there is still a union, at least here in Los Angeles, for the employees that work at Staples Center, Dodger Stadium. Those are all actually one union called Unite Here, Local 11. Um, and together, they have representation with a firm. And each of the employees, you know, I think it's like $50 out of every monthly paycheck mm -hmm. is reserved for legal um, services. So if they have questions about immigration matters or if they had questions about bankruptcy or divorce, um, consumer protection things, some minor landlord tenant things, they would just direct those questions towards the law firm. Mm -hmm. um, so I, as a starting attorney, had to know a little bit about a lot of different areas of law. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very fortunate to get that opportunity because in that initial position, the people are have already paid the dues, so yep. they don't owe anything. So that, you know, the monetary aspect is kind of taken out of the equation. So yep. it, it's an only, it's a pure, let me help you as best as I can situation. Hmm. Um, so yeah. Which I, is a unique experience. You oh, know, absolutely. Usually an initial consultation, especially if it's a free consultation, that's always threaded in. It's like, okay, let me help you and I need to, convert you into a client, right? And Absolutely. You get paid, whereas if you're able to just to come from a standpoint of pure service, um, how, how does that impact nowadays? I mean, you're obviously doing free consultations with mm -hmm. clients, but does that same spirit of, of, of help and service come? Is it related to that in some way? Absolutely. Um, I tell my clients all the leads that I talk to on the phone, the ones that I get to have the privilege of meeting in person, I tell them, you know, I don't like wasting their time, and of course I don't like wasting my time, because I need to focus on the people who you know, have put their faith um, in me to help them. So I try to do everything I can. Um, even on the phone calls, I try to give them a miniature consultation just so they see that I have understood and care about their problem. Um, and as soon as I get them on the phone, I'm, I'm right into solution mode saying, OK, let's see what we can do. If it's something I can help you with, I'll tell you directly. If it's something that I cannot help you with, I will try my best to maybe refer you to um, a different attorney that might. Or, you know, honestly, in the immigration field, there are times where it might be best not to do anything. Um, and I say that carefully, but, you know, there are times when people have been, quote unquote, living under the radar for a while. and sometimes jumping in and raising their hand up and letting the government know that they are here might not serve them in their best interest. So yeah. I try to be open and honest. And if I'm like that, um, people generally respond well. Mm -hmm. And they, they can sense that I care. They can sense that you know I'm not in it just for the money. I want to make sure that I get the results that they want mm -hmm. um, and that I'm you know, because at the end of the day, it's people try to immigrate to pursue dreams or reconnect with family or, um, you know, just make a better life for themselves. And if my getting involved is going to cause some problem for them, I tell them honestly that these are the risks and it might not be worth your time taking that risk right now. Right. And as long as you're honest, I think people can sense that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it reminds me a bit about what Sue talked about this on, on her podcast, um, being really honest. And, and also, a lot of immigrant people, especially, you know, they're going online and searching, don't necessarily know whether you're on their side or not, Correct. right? Like, are you the government? Are you my attorney? Are you a shadow, <laughs> you know, person? Or you know, it's like, so um, being honest and being able to, make clear that you're someone that is protecting them mm -hmm. and you're going to give them straight advice, I would assume really helps people make, it also make, makes them feel a lot more comfortable knowing that they have someone that's on their side. Absolutely. Right? That actually reminds me. So before I, you know, became familiar with unbundled attorney services and legal services, I was doing my own Google AdWords and such. And there was some success. I was using less money um, to get some people to call in or click on my links, but the quality wasn't there. People would call and it's surprising how many people would call and 
and say, you know, I have a neighbor I need to deport, or um, this guy he lives across the street from me, and I don't like him, and I think he's illegal. And well, I and I ask them honestly, like, what did you Google to <laughs> to get my number to think that I'm going to help you with this? Yeah, they how said, how did you deport? They, they just said uh, <laughs> immigration, and you know, that's one of my keywords for Google AdWords, and it pops up, and they just call the first number they see, mm -hmm. and they think it's the government. So. Yes. You're right. There is definitely confusion there. Well, even there's fear. There's, yeah. yeah. Even with citizens, they're looking for, you know, the government, for example. But if they type in immigration and my Google AdWords populates, mm -hmm. it's not effective. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is a science to the, to the AdWords. Yeah. Um, so obviously there's been a, a lot of changes in immigration, in the environment, in the in the you know, politically and also and then that's basically caused a cascade of of impacts and um, affects on the way you have to practice as an immigration lawyer, just as far as keeping track of things, Absolutely. and also f from the client side, like a lot of the fears. You know, you mentioned um, you know a lot of people being concerned about securing citizenship that have been permanent residents that otherwise couldn't, right? So, um, could you share just a bit about you know how this landscape has changed, uh, either since the new administration or just recently? Um, you know, just yeah. both for the clients and for you as a practitioner. Absolutely. Um, it has absolutely changed, and I think that fear is the word that comes to mind. There has been an increased fear uh, in the immigrant population, in the undocumented immigrant population especially. Um, and these are individuals, and you see it, and they'll never show it, but you can sense it after you know, many years of doing this. They have a burden on their shoulders that they carry day in and day out. You know, they've had children here and the children are going through school and have graduated high school and such. Um, and you don't truly see that burden lifted from these individuals' shoulders until, you know, the green card is in their hand. Yeah. And, and then you, you can almost physically see them stand up taller and stand up straighter. Wow. Um, but they feel like they'll almost yeah, be hiding, right? Exactly. Like, so, wow. so there is more of that. There is more people hiding. Um, and there is an elevated fear. And what I tell my clients when they have, you know, the, the wherewithal and the courage to, to look for the answers, I commend them for that. You know, that's one of the first things I say. Like, I honor you for taking a chance and looking for help and knowing that you need help. Um, but I warn them. I warn them against, you know, people who aren't fully licensed as attorneys trying to take advantage of their fear. Um, mm -hmm. And I always tell them, like, don't let anybody scare you into giving away a lot of money to solve a problem that they might not actually be able to solve. Yeah. Um, so that's been helpful and that goes on to showing care that, yes, I understand you're afraid and I understand you might even be panicking right now. My job is to calm you down rather than take advantage of that panic and say, okay, give me $5,000, for example, mm -hmm. and I'll take care of it. Otherwise, you know, Yeah, X, y, right, Z. and uh, they're otherwise they're knocking at your door or something. That's simply not true. I try, to, I try to walk them back from the cliff and talk them down from the ledge. And yes. that, when they see that and when they sense that, um, they appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, that's what I strive for. And they... Those are the people who, for example, even if I can't help them, they are more inclined to refer me to somebody else that might need immigration help. Yeah, well, you're peeling more towards their what they're looking to see happen or what they're trying to hope. accomplish instead of feeding the fear. Right. Feeding. Right. I'm trying to feed hope That's right. instead of the fear. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And can you talk just briefly because we um, you were talking about notarios and mm -hmm. different types of things. Um, as immigration lawyers or even immigration people that are looking into co coming to the immigration field, mm -hmm. what is it, you know, in, in, in Los Angeles is a unique market, so you could speak directly about Los Angeles Correct. and different, you know, markets are going to have more or less of these types of groups uh, and right. agencies that are existing, but what are the types of things that, you know, some immigrants or, uh, you know, people, clients that are trying to get legal uh, assistance are going to be exposed to, some of the things they need to watch out for, um, and, and how do you kind of help them communicate and understand the differences between what that is and what it is that you do, right? That's a good question, um, and it, you know, at its most pure, I think it's a language difference. So, whereas in a country like Mexico, 
a notario or a notaria might be very well a licensed attorney, abogado, and they might use those terms interchangeably, but there are individuals that use that term here in the States, especially in Los Angeles, um, that very well know that people expect the notario or notaria to you know, be held to the standard of an attorney, maybe mm -hmm. in Mexico, but that that word, notaria, notaria, is not the same as abogado, abogada here. Mm -hmm. And this isn't just in the Spanish-speaking community. I see it in the Filipino, Indian, Chinese, even Korean and uh, Russian communities. They have people who maybe speak English better mm -hmm. than the client looking for help. Yeah. And that person, because of their English um, understanding, they can help with things like taxes um, and all the forms, for example, for USCIS uh, immigration services. It's all online for free. So anyone can pull up the forms. Um, but what people need to be aware of is if they are not licensed attorneys or accredited representatives, those individuals will not be allowed to come with them to interviews. Um, and you know it's similar to the effort done by the government to prevent you know, unlicensed tax preparers. If they don't sign, then um, they're not licensed, for example. So right. oftentimes I'll get clients that come in here and they show me a bunch of paperwork filed by somebody and it has been filed in a way where it's, uh, it shows that she or he filed it themselves without yes. the help of anybody. Without a preparer. Right. Um, so they need to be aware of that. And immigration law is federal, so the person might not be licensed here in California, but they have to be licensed somewhere. Uh, so don't be afraid, clients, to ask for license numbers and licensure because that stuff is important. Um, and we're held to a higher standard for a reason because we are entrusted with, in my case, people's lives, mm -hmm. families' um, lives. So make sure you do your due diligence, check to find out which state they're licensed in and what their number is. And each of those states has a website uh, where you can check to make sure that the individual is who they are or who they say they are um, and make sure you prepare and um, protect yourself that way and I guess it's one of those things where if it sounds too good to be true mm -hmm. if the number that they're quoting you for a certain thing is sounds too good to be true it very well might be yeah um, immigration strikes me as as a field of law in which there's a there's a there's a extraordinary amount of vulnerability mm -hmm. and so because of that vulnerability and because of that fear it almost seems like immigration lawyers have to have a greater sense of responsibility Absolutely. a greater sense of integrity to because it's so it would be not easy but it's like you know these people are in a very um, vulnerable position That's right? The right word and so you know you have to have that same sensitivity to their circumstance and their situation and and be that that beacon or that that you know person of truth and trust i i see some of my clients come in here and they remind me of a spinning compass like they are just in it and they don't know which way to go and i tell them from the start i'm glad you're here my job is to point you in the direction yeah and that's the first step and you know when they leave and they feel a sense of relief, understanding, okay, what's the next step? Um, I've stopped their spinning compass and I feel much better about that than yeah. they do too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, what would be really helpful, I think, especially for a lot of the attorneys that are listening, is just to, you know, for, for a while you were servicing clients from quite a while, mm -hmm. quite a, a wide, um, a wide set of regions. Mm -hmm. So you're getting clients. You're, you're in Los Angeles. You were looking. I think you're getting leads from Orange County, mm -hmm. Riverside, Ventura, Los Angeles, mm -hmm. San Bernardino as mm -hmm. well. No. No. Okay. Not yet. Um, and so there were some some things that you were implementing to in order to help them uh, to help secure those appointments and mm -hmm. get them to come in and, and not flake and so forth. Right. Um, so can you talk a bit about just the ge serving the geographic region, and then, and then from there I'd love to just unpack in general. Uh, some of the ways in which you've been helping folks you know more affordably and just working within their budget and stuff too right um things are fluid and i've been trying different things what i was doing with clients out in riverside is i was trying to book them on one particular day of the week for example like a friday mm -hmm. um, 
choose a time where traffic is least crazy yeah. and try to get out there and you know back to back stack the appointments yes and that was helpful um, I've also made available things like um, Skype or FaceTime and if they want to take that they can do that otherwise one of the very first questions I'll ask if these individuals are outside of my county or my um, Los Angeles area I'll ask if they are coming to LA for any other thing are you coming for I don't know an event or to meet with somebody else mm -hmm. and oftentimes yeah they they make their trek in at least a couple times a month and if I can line up with that it's more convenient for them um, and they appreciate that and then the other thing that I was doing is if I am going to be driving a couple of hours out to meet them I try to do with um, one of the other attorneys had recommended and secure a credit card mm -hmm. and tell them that I'm only taking this credit card um, as a you know security against you not showing up and then charge fifty dollars and if I explain that and I'm honest and tell them my office is located in LA for example uh, but I'm gonna be taking the time to drive out there they understand and they're willing to give their credit card um, hmm. it's something that I'm trying to implement here in the Los Angeles location as well yeah but I guess I'm just nice it's convenient my location here is not too far from where I live so even if they miss appointments I guess I've been a little bit more lenient mm -hmm. with my Los Angeles clientele than you know further out um, but it is it is, is a good tactic to get some skin in the game I think mm -hmm. is is what it is um, get a number down and then they know that they have to make it yeah um, and for those of you that are that podcast interview is with Tara Lee uh, I think it's called uh, Proven Sales Strategies to Convert More Leads and Eliminate No-Shows. We really do unpack a, a process you could use that he implemented. He served San Bernardino and Riverside um, that would just ask the clients to put a card on file. He doesn't charge them anything, but they put a card on file and then in the event that they don't show up, he charges them a fee. And just the act of clients just putting a card on file mm -hmm. virtually eliminated all no-shows. He didn't even have to charge them. Right. Just knowing that if they don't show up, they're going to pay. Um, ensured that people were committed to coming in. And probably on some level, if they're not willing to put a card on file and put the skin on the game, right. then why are you putting your skin on the game and, and setting aside that time or making that effort, right? So Absolutely. in a way, it, it, it's a nice way to take their temperature and make sure that they're serious. Yes. Yep. Cool. So maybe a good place to, to, to kind of dive in is obviously you're someone that's very passionate about immigration and passionate about helping people. Uh, could you just take us through your know, basic process from whether you receive a lead or a call, or come, somebody comes in? You're a solo practitioner too, right? Correct. So at this point, don't, no staff, no paralegals or anything else. So um, you're handling things from start to finish. So could you take us through you know, from when you talk to the lead, how that consultation goes, what your initial uh, goal is on that consultation? Obviously, I think it's to come in. Right. And then from there, just talk about the different you know, models or options you've been able to offer people to make things also a little bit more affordable. Sure. Um, of course, with immigration, there's the full range. I get, you know, leads that are typed out in all caps and says, my, <laughs> my brother's been picked up at the border. Um, that's a completely <coughs> different phone call yeah. than, you know, I'm a citizen and I want to petition my wife. Um, those are less panicky uh, and happier. But ultimately, I believe that the sooner you get them on the phone, the, the better and I've realized that as well so what I do is on my phone I have a separate tone uh, and every time an email comes in from unbundled um, the leads it rings a specific tone so I know immediately that it is another lead and that I'm on the clock but that's and on iPhone too it's just, it just says if an email comes from this this address then play this tone I, so I've dedicated one of my email addresses specifically to okay. unbundled um, okay so you've basically created a separate email account mm -hmm. that where you receive your unbundled leads mm -hmm. and then when an email comes into that account you mm -hmm. have it play a different notification sound correct it's the it. only notification sound all my other emails would be blowing up all day so <laughs> it's the only email box that I allow a sound notification to come out on well it's an important point because a lot of attorneys will you know, have notifications going for all their Absolutely. their emails just to make sure it's not a lead, make sure it's not a lead, make mm -hmm. sure it's not a lead, right? Or, or a new client hitting them up. 
Whereas if you can separate that, which is you know one of the things we do is with the text messaging, right. you get the notifications. But if you don't have that that feature, then you know having something that would make that right. delineate it from everything else, so you're not constantly having to check your the email. text. The text messages help because, as you said in one of our first calls, I think the redundancy is security, and I always believe that with things like my calendar as well. Redundancy is security. Hmm. Um, so yeah, email, text, you know, <laughs> calls like those. The more times I'm reached out to, um, the, the better the chances I'm not going to miss it. Yes. So once I get the initial lead in, I try to call within the first five minutes. Of course, if it's in the middle of the night, I try to at least send an email or a text. Um, and you and I were talking offline about automating that process, which is going to help. And then once I get them on the phone, um, I try to keep calls within 15 minutes. Uh -huh. uh, just give them a sense of who I am, my level of care, uh, my level of understanding and experience in the, the issue that they're dealing with. Um, and I've been fortunate that the vast majority of the calls that I've been receiving or the, the leads that I've been receiving, there's something I can do for them. Or mm -hmm. it's a situation that I've seen before. Um, yeah. There are some outliers and I just become a better attorney learning about those situations. So I'm appreciative of that. But after I get them on the phone, um, I try to you know, give them the time to talk. And I try to show them that I'm empathetic and I'm giving them attention and respect. Um, but I don't let them railroad me into this whole long story. And mm -hmm. I, I try to keep it, you know, because time is valuable, I try to keep it within 15 minutes. Assess whether or not it's somebody that I want to bring in. And there are times when I can just tell off the bat there's nothing that we can do that will help them. Yes. Um, and, I, and I tell them, hey, I don't want to waste your time and I'm going to be open and honest with you. It might be best for you to not do anything right now. And when they hear that and they hear the sincerity in my voice, they are ecstatic. And those are those individuals that as soon as something in their uh, situation changes or as soon as they get this one uh, police clearance or this one missing document, I'm going to be the first person they call. Um, yeah. So if I can bring them in and if I can help them, I try to schedule something immediately. Um, often I ask if they can come in that day. And a couple do. A couple have said, I'm you know, so scared about this matter that I couldn't work today. Mm -hmm. And I just jumped online. I started you know, pounding in searches. Your name came up. You're talking to me now. I would love to meet you today. And those are, those are great because it shows that all they had to do was take the first step to look for help and bam, yeah. here I am. So yeah. that's my objective. And then once they come in, um, I like to express to them that I'm, I'm human too. I, I know I'm an attorney and people expect attorneys to make tons of money. And I've seen often in other firms where they don't bat an eye at quoting somebody an initial down payment of $2,000 or something. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen working with the union members and working with my clients over the years is that's really difficult. That's, that's more than rent sometimes um, yes. to she request. Absolutely, Texas, yeah. absolutely. So for an attorney to simply flippantly throw a number like that out, I've realized scares a lot of um, clients. I, I don't try to hide the final number. I do say, you're looking at a case in this range, yes. um, but I want to help you each step of the way. And mm -hmm. if I try to do this for you and it doesn't work, there's no point in you paying me for the things thereafter. Right. So let's take the step at a time, uh, one step at a time. And I try to give them an honest evaluation of what the time frame looks like. So this is going to take me a couple weeks. Um, I would appreciate payment in the form of every week and okay. smaller amounts. Ultimately, it might be the same big amount, but it gives them faith that I'm only charging them for what I'm doing for them. And they appreciate that honesty. They appreciate me understanding that it is hard to just drop $2,000 on a dime. Yeah. Um, so that's what I've been trying to do. And fortunately, um, a lot of the cases in like immigration court you can just take it one step at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a little different from some of the other areas that you service, the other areas of law, in that in immigration court, if you enter your appearance once, 
until the judge says you're off the hook, you yeah. are the attorney. So yes. I tell them honestly, I tell the clients honestly that it's not as simple as just making one appearance. If I make one, then I'm expected to be there for all of them. And uh, again, everything is just open communication. And as long as I help the individual understand why I'm charging what I'm charging and I am open and honest about what I normally charge for mm -hmm. hourly rate uh, yeah. versus the reduction in fees that I give if they choose to do a, a flat fee agreement, uh, they appreciate that. They appreciate that I'm telling them, I'm expecting to work so and so number of hours on this mm -hmm. case. Normally I charge you know, $400 an hour, but if you, you know, want to go um, flat fee, I pretty much double my time for you, and I give you my hourly rate at half the rate. And you know, my job, of course, behind the scenes is to try to be as efficient as possible, mm -hmm. get the work done, yes. but be as efficient as possible. But as long as they see that and they understand why the number is coming out to mm -hmm. what it is, I think they appreciate that. And so, so you what you do you do flat rates or is it hour by hour or how do you, it's like? I do a flat rate. Um, uh huh. But what we could do is just give an example okay. of a typical case. Let's say it's an adjustment of status so, or whatever it might be. What would it, what's the total cost of what you would right. think? So and a then typical, how might you break that up? So a typical adjustment meaning no problems, there has been no unlawful entry or no unauthorized stay, uh, no unauthorized employment and such. I'm looking in the $2,400 range right now. And uh -huh. I know that that's a little bit low compared to some of the other attorneys in Los Angeles. Um, but I do use some software that helps expedite the process. Yes. And I explain that to the clients that I can offer a lower rate because they're going to help me help them. They're going to do some of the, you know, data entry, such as yes. address history or employment history, things that they know how to answer. Um, and I tell them that the reason I work with a company like Unbundled Legal Services is because the individuals that can type in the information on a web query can very well help me help them mm -hmm. by you know utilizing things like border wise I think they just changed their name to docket wise um, that's the software the yeah that's the, the software. software so all I have to do is type in their email address and it sends out a questionnaire and they can answer certain forms and such like that mm -hmm. um, well it's, it's the clients doing some legwork yeah know, to, to save money right like handling Absolutely. some parts on their own getting you the information so you're not spending that that time, that, that those efficiencies, offloading some of that work right. to the client, having them help out by doing some of that makes it more affordable. Right. And, and you're I, communicating that to them. Absolutely. And I tell them that ideally I want my fee paid before I file, namely because I'm pretty much done with my work at that time. I have to show up for the interview, of course. Um, and they understand that. And they understand that I give them a time frame. Uh, if we do this quickly, I can do this in a week. But in that case, you need to pay me accordingly. Yep. Um, I don't intend or I don't want to hold any cases longer than I need to. Yes. Um, but in my normal time frame, I say like a month. And it's going to take me a month to get all the documents. And I tell them the faster you work with me, the faster we can get this done. Um, but normally people understand that. And if I tell them it's going to take four weeks and I can cut up the payments in before, yeah. they're, they're you know, more than happy to do that. Right, so they might pay something like two, three, four, five hundred dollars down to get started. Yep. And then, and then you have like a, a payment schedule laid out with them, like okay, right. so and and do you use the do you LawPay the auto yeah. bring yet or I did. We can share a bit about. How so that. I started using LawPay to accept credit card payments. Um, I was trying PayPal before, but that one wasn't as efficient. Mm -hmm. And the software with LawPay and just being able to send a quick bill has been uh, really beneficial. Um, and you know. I think there's more trust when they receive a request from something like LawPay. Um, you know. Yeah, and so and they have like an automated recurring billing feature. Yeah. And so let's say, for example, it's let's just say thousand dollars, right? And it's going to take four weeks, right? You would say, okay, so two fifty a week, right? Every Friday, so you put the the date. The interval every week, right? And so the I, amount. I make sure period, I right? put that in my retainer agreement as well, so that they understand on this date, um, this is going out, and that's what I I charge. Um, yeah, and again, open and honest communication. As long as they're not surprised by it, then we're good. Well, yeah, and it's huge. I mean, it's hugely impactful that you know someone doesn't have to come up with two, three grand up front. 
and the fees are the same. It's going to take a period of time, maybe a month, mm -hmm. two months, whatever it is the amount of time. It gives people that amount of time to come up with the money, and they don't have this massive tripwire they have to right. you know, try to jump over right, in right, order right. to get started. Right. Absolutely. So I can I can see that, that would be really really helpful for a lot of people. Okay, cool. And so, so you've got the pay as you go. Are, are there some, and you mentioned that you have some streamline some software built in, in the back end that helps to make things a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk just a little bit about what you've what you've used in the past? Uh, we've had some other attorneys that have come on in the podcast and shared, you know, I and Assume and, and right. some other different softwares that are working. You also mentioned that there's been some challenges with this because the forms are changing so much. Right. So maybe just how is it helping and then some of the things that you've had to do to make sure it continues to work well. Right. I mean, ultimately, it's my name and my license number and my signature um, on these documents at the end of the day. So I have learned uh, <laughs> some hard lessons previously where I fully trusted um, you know, a program like INS Zoom or Immigration Pro or even my docket wise that I'm using now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what it comes down to is there's always room for human error. There's room for human error when they're creating the form through USCIS. And there's room for error when um, one of these third party companies takes one of these PDFs from USCIS and then begins to decide which fields need to be populated on their own. Yep. Um, and as an attorney, as especially as an immigration attorney on these forms, it has to be perfect. It has to be precise. And uh, you can't afford mistakes. So it might help in the initial intake um, of the client information to get all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you still need to check everything, um, every box. And that's where the time goes in. Um, and that's, and I tell that to the clients too, that yeah, you know, just because the information they're putting in might not be fully accurate doesn't mean I'm just going to, you know, hit send or print it out and send it off as soon as they sent it to me. Uh, I reassure them that my job is still to look over everything uh, and make sure that all the information is correct and perfect. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously part of this is because there's so much changes in the policies of immigration. Right. A lot of the different forms are getting needing to be updated or or, or changed, right. or like pathways that didn't exist don't anymore. Or you know, um, can you give some examples of some stuff that's that's been updated since maybe Trump's presidency? Yeah, um, um, that you've had to manage. And, and it's and it's a timing thing. So previous administrations, things would change maybe once a year, if that. You know, and oftentimes these forms have been around for many years with no problem. Um, but the administration, if they want to ask one more question on these forms, they got to update the form. And um, there are forms like the I-485, which is the green card application, mm -hmm. yep. and the, of course, the petition that is linked to that. Those forms have changed. The requirements have changed. And you know, unfortunately, in the transitions, um, there are times when I'll do the entire form or entire forms with the client, and then I have to call them back in to do a new form because. Yep. By the time the client has got me, uh, you know, the final filing fee or the supporting documents, the form has expired. Um, yeah. And I don't know if it's an administrative thing or the administration thing, just trying to trip up immigrants and immigration attorneys. <laughs> um, but I'm sure all the other immigration attorneys know out there that we all have to be on our toes, especially mm -hmm. now. Um, got to be extra careful and yeah. make sure all of the I's are dotted and T's are crossed. Do you have any perspectives um, on a broader sense of what is happening in the United States uh, from an immigration standpoint and from the standpoint of an immigration lawyer mm -hmm. and where things are headed and maybe some of the things we have to hmm. watch out for or be aware of or you're just, mm -hmm. I'm just curious to your perspective of what's unfolded and where things are headed. Right. Let's, let's not, you know, cloud the issue. Obama. President Obama was deporting and removing tons of people too. Yeah. Um, but there, there's a different culture out there now in that, um, and I, I still tell my clients that there are still good people on that side. There are still yes. good people on the government that try to do things the correct way and try to help out in any way that they can. For example, a lot of immigration judges in at least Los Angeles have previously been immigrant uh, immigration attorneys so they understand the challenges they some of them still have the best interests of immigrants in mind which is great yeah. um, 
but the problem is the government attorneys are under you know the attorney general and whatever Trump wants them to do and if they want to take a hard line stance um, you know they do so whereas before the government attorneys would be more willing and likely to join for mm -hmm. example in a motion to terminate a case that can obviously be taken care of uh, by USCIS instead of immigration court um, that used to be almost done as a courtesy for the judge's docket. Just to clear up the docket, the government attorney used to agree to close something so USCIS could adjudicate it. Uh, but now they're simply not allowed to. Yeah. So even if it takes more time and resources and energy and effort, they're still told that they have to take a hardline stance. So even these attorneys that don't want to um, waste their time or waste my time or waste the judge's time, they're still required to. Yes. Um, so that's changed and you know something that should cost almost nothing at all to simply send a request to have them join in a motion now takes extra money and extra time yeah. and you know I have to explain it to the clients like this is what's going on and yeah. this is the direct impact of this administration on these people's lives it trickles yes. all the way down and it trickles down quickly um, you know in I guess what I've seen is there are those that are good, but there are those that are not so good and that they love the fact that the administration is the way it is right now. They love being able to flex their muscles a little bit more than they did under the Obama administration. Um, so for example, you know, a denaturalization committee where Trump has assigned people to double check the naturalization applications that were filed during the Obama administration just to you know and like, that's that's crazy yeah. um, and sometimes I wonder is it just because the guy's skin was black that everything under him has to be double checked triple checked and undone if possible um, you know we see we see it now with DACA for example that's the hot button issue uh, yes. with the dreamers and the children and I have multiple clients who are DACA recipients and you know, literally two years old at the time of entry. They had no options at all. Um, but they're being told that they are foreigners and that they must leave the country. And, you know, temporary protected statuses are, are being dropped. Um, so yeah, it is, times are changing, but we just have to, you know, look out for each other. And again, my job is to instill hope and lead in that way instead of feeding on fear and feeding fear yeah absolutely and, you know we all hear you know and i'm also i'm also an immigrant as well from canada mm. my family's from canada and even in my own family you know we've been you know, my mother for example is a permanent resident she's having the thought like oh well, maybe i should file for citizenship mm. so there's, it's very clear that there's an enormous amount more fear Yes. Amongst immigrant, amongst the clients, but just even as an attorney, it's been a lot more challenging for you to to yep. to manage those emotions of the clients, manage those fears, and also deal with the administrative challenges of mm -hmm. all of that. Um, and so, it's really helpful to hear your perspective on it because it's not just the the, the people themselves; it's the immigrant, the attorneys like yourself have to step up. Yes. To be able to to serve people. Yes. Through these you know these times. We have to step up. We have to resist. We have to fight back. And, you know, and as heavy of a burden as it might be for me, I have to understand that for these clients, it's that much heavier. Um, because I mess up and I lose a case and I'm sad. And if I did it right, hopefully I don't lose my license. But if I mess up and I lose a case, they lose a father, they lose a husband, they lose a mother or a child. And that should be unacceptable. Um, that's how I feel about that. Yeah. 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 No, it's a it's a great deal of responsibility, big deal of commitment that uh, you know all lawyers are being tested with uh, work in the immigration field specifically right now. Hmm. Um, that goes well beyond just affordability and accessibility. It's it's really being accountable right. and uh, and being their advocate at a time right. that's uh, that's very uncertain for many people in this in this in this industry. All right. So, listen, Charles. This has been. Uh, Really helpful to hear your perspective. Um, as I said before, we really appreciate all the work you're doing for the clients we're sending you in Los Angeles and the surrounding areas. 
Um, we've just gotten some really amazing feedback, and obviously, uh, it's having a, a good positive impact on, <laughs> your, on your practice as well. Very much so. Um, and I, I appreciate your commitment to to serving clients in times that uh, they really do need someone on their side that's committed to their success and is willing to be honest and and, and fight for them. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much. That's really needed right now. Yeah, I agree. So with that, we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks for everyone that's joining us on the podcast every couple of weeks. Uh, we're obviously really excited about the fact that we're now doing video podcasts with amazing lawyers like Charles here. So thank <laughs> you for coming on and thank being you part for having of this, me. Uh, this new uh, this new effort to you know be a little bit more personal and, and really share uh, some of the experiences of what's being take what it takes to you know make services more affordable in this country and also serve people in the immigration arena, family law, and uh, other areas of law as well. So thank you for participating. Thank you for applying these strategies into your practice as well. Um, to connect with us, obviously we have the YouTube channel now. We're gonna be serving up uh, new video podcasts uh, regularly, uh, probably once a month is what we're looking at. And of course you can follow us on Facebook. If you just search for Unbound Attorney on Facebook, uh, we post there as well all of our new episodes and anything we're doing as a company. Um, lots of great things in the works. Uh, but we appreciate you participating and we'll certainly see you all on the next episode. For more information about how our exclusive unbundled leads can help you grow your practice, visit our website at unbundledattorney.com. You can watch each new episode of the podcast on the Unbundled Attorney YouTube channel, or if you prefer to listen, you can find us on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And be sure to subscribe so you get each new episode as soon as it's available. And remember to leave us your review on iTunes. We read each and every one of them and really appreciate your support of the show. Once again, thanks for listening.